Sitting down to eat at the table always requires some degree of order and civility, of good manners and courtesy. And while it might seem that some animals are uncouth slobs, like these vultures, in fact, there is a definite organization among them. Dinner time reveals the importance of each individual and their place at the table. Hierarchies and social organization are imposed in many species when sharing a tasty snack. Social insects have a very strict diet in terms of the type of food each individual eats, as the food provided to them when they are larvae defines which caste they will belong to. Etiquette is fundamental, and the pecking order at the table may be vital to the survival of the group. For a relaxed meal, no details should be overlooked. So some species put a guard on duty while they eat, to guarantee their dinner time avoids turning into the dinner time of a predator. Many species of animals, from insects to birds and mammals, have their own social organization, often reflected at the dinner table. No matter how wild they might seem, all have their manners, which are extremely useful for survival. When meerkats emerge from their burrows, the first thing they do is take a look around. Their neighbors woke up a while ago. It seems that today will be fine, but it's well worth checking around for any nearby threat. Meerkats are small mongooses that live in communities. Once the eagle leaves, it seems the danger has gone too. So it's time for breakfast. There may be up to 40 individuals in a colony, and they get along pretty well. They build a complex network of galleries that they use for cover and for sleeping at night. Their social customs include a striking pose when on guard, watching out for each other while eating. There's nothing better than a few energy-giving bugs to start the day. At this time of year, they eat countless termites, while the lookouts guard the restaurant door. Meerkats enthusiastically look for their food, digging with their powerful claws, turning over stones, and searching between the rocks. It seems that their sense of smell is unerring, allowing them to detect the different kinds of insects that make up their diet underground. Their diet is varied, 
but insects form the bulk of their daily menu at 82% of the total. The rest of their meals are made up of spiders, other arthropods, and some lizards, snakes, and birds. While the group feasts on insects and larvae, sentries sit on their haunches and remain alert to any danger. They work until the changing of the guard relieves them, allowing the group to devour everything in the vicinity. Eating peacefully is a pleasure for these small mongooses, all thanks to their excellent organizational skills. On the other side of the world, in the rainforests, there are also animals that are organized in small family clans. Living and eating as a family is very useful because it's easier to find food in numbers and the pack can also cope better with any predator. Peccaries are wild pigs with a very active and complex social life. They inhabit tropical rainforests and are also present in savannas and dry forests. They are diurnal animals that live in groups that can vary widely from two or three up to 50 individuals. The average number of family members is between six and nine. Groups of peccaries stay together and cooperate to defend the herd but form smaller subgroups that disperse in order to feed. Studies have shown that peccaries are omnivores, and locals claim they also feed on poisonous snakes. But they have to be careful. Some snakes can easily strangle and swallow a pig. Peccaries are both highly social and communicative. They have at least 15 different types of calls, signaling alarm, submission, and aggression. When in danger, a single cry warns the whole group. Although they eat a wide range of food, the peccaries that live in the forests are especially frugivorous, and palm fruits and seeds are their main food source. In dry countries, their diet consists mainly of roots. The security the group offers allows this mother some peace of mind while her young, already quite large, suckle during a rest break. Meanwhile, her fellow herd members wander around their territory, checking that everything is quiet. There's nothing like a good lunch in good company. But eating in company is not always fair to all members of a group. Many animals have a marked social hierarchy in which everyone has a place, differentiating the leaders from the rest of the herd. and the leaders always have an advantage, especially when eating. Deer form groups that usually include females of different ages and the young of the current year. 
They are apparently peaceful and friendly groups in which everyone shares equally the daily menu that nature provides. They spend much of the day grazing on blades of grass and nutrient-rich shoots. But they do so according to the strict etiquette that exists among wild deer sororities. In this club, the dominant does benefit from their status and choose the best bits of the diet when food is plentiful. The subordinates are forced to eat what the dominant females leave behind. And this difference in status is most noticeable when food is not plentiful, especially during years when there's drought. Male deer violently impose the herd's hierarchy, driven by the mating instinct. Their aim is simply to have all possible females under their control. And during the mating season, the males barely even think about eating. The females must constantly think about eating, even during the rut, as it is highly likely that they will be pregnant with a new fawn. The higher ranking doe spend much more time eating and have access to the best food, selecting the fattiest and most energy filled foods. Meanwhile, younger and lower class does must be satisfied with leftovers. Of course, the dominant does are the veterans and are usually larger and heavier. The issue of hierarchy is very important for effectively structuring animal groups, especially carnivores. Among wolves, the law of tooth and claw is what governs. Wolves have a strict hierarchical society. The pack is led by one alpha male and one alpha female. Among other advantages this social structure allows the pack is obtaining food resources that a single wolf could never manage alone, such as a large bison or elk. So it's an essential aspect of survival. The ranking within the pack is fairly strict, with the leaders at the top, and it affects all activities of the group from who eats first to who is allowed to reproduce. The pecking order is established and maintained through a series of ritualized fights and threatening postures. Mealtime is the perfect moment to show who is boss and what rank everyone else holds. When they gather to eat, the character of each individual's place in the clan is clear, and so are everybody's aspirations. The way group structure is maintained and enforced varies widely between herd and between animals. Now, when they sit down to eat, 
the tension in the air is palpable. Wolves prefer psychological warfare to actual combat, and dominance is based more on personality and attitude than size or strength. In fact, in this pack, it seems that a young cub dominates at mealtime. Animals may lose rank either gradually or suddenly, and this change in status is perceived at the dinner table. The oldest wolf may make way when confronted with a stronger or more combative male, and then wait patiently for his turn to eat. Insects also have their own strict dining etiquette. Leaf cutter ants are another example of how societies of insects, especially the Hymenoptera, ants, bees and wasps, are structured. Leaf cutters are very organized and have very specific job profiles for the different tasks within the colony. The workers are divided into different castes, each with its own characteristics. The size and appearance of each caste is very different. Medium-sized ants are responsible for collecting, cutting and transporting the fragments of leaves the colony needs to survive. The effect of their labors on the plants of the jungle is impressive in its efficiency. The smaller ants of another caste are responsible for defending the others. They patrol in large groups near and inside the nest and along the paths the workers make. The mission of the larger ants is also to defend the nest and keep out intruders. The largest can measure nearly two centimeters in length. They are known as soldier ants, but they also perform other activities, like clearing the paths and transporting large pieces of food to the nest. Another cast of workers, the smallest ants, live inside the nest. They are gardeners, whose task is the cultivation and care of the fungus that they feed. They manage and control the leaf fragments that come from the outside and which form the substrate used for growing the fungus inside the colony. It might seem that no other animal compares with such perfect, measured organization as these leafcutter ants, but that is not in fact true. Although this may look like a street fight, vultures have their own way of organizing a lunchtime meal. The hungriest approach first, in this case a black vulture. 
Then, other ravenous vultures are also encouraged to peck the corpse. Then the fight is on. Other birds drop directly from the sky and are not welcome. The apparent chaos among the vultures is in fact the hierarchy of hunger. The behavior of vultures regarding food has been studied in detail with reference to aggression and hierarchies. Ornithologists have deciphered what seems to be the remarkably chaotic and violent behavior of feeding vultures. When feeding on carrion, they clearly show the temporary dominance of some individuals, which fight and chase others off for just enough time to gain access to the corpse and hurriedly swallow a few pieces of meat. These are the hungriest individuals, who secrete saliva continuously until they fill their stomachs. It may be that the degree of aggression is proportional to this secretion of saliva. The force with which they defend their well-owned place at the dinner table depends on the intensity of their hunger. Although the fight seem very violent, with birds jumping, clawing, kicking and pecking each other, accompanied by screeches and squawks, no one is actually injured. It seems that hunger is the motivating force behind the aggression of the vultures and what determines a fleeting hierarchy that disappears when the appetite is satisfying. Of course, there are other birds with much better manners. The common partridge, for example, is an example of perfect civility. Partridge chicks are guarded by their parents from birth. They develop quickly and a few hours after hatching are able to run around the field with their fellow chicks and two or three adults that care for them. It seems that harmony is the rule in the family life of the partridges. The clutch, usually of no more than 16 chicks, walks around with their mother pecking at everything in their path. At a week old, they are able to hunt the invertebrates that make up two-thirds of their menu. The rest of their diet is composed of seeds and flowers. As they grow, their diet changes to include more plants than insects. When fully grown, they will eat about 70 grams of food a day, of which 50 grams will be cereal. But for now, the mother partridge leads them to the best places to eat, protecting them whenever danger appears. When they find a suitable spot, they will relax and take an enjoyable sand bath. This forms part of a regime of strict personal hygiene and helps them care for their plumage and stay parasite free. The chicks waste no time in learning the pleasures of this activity. 
sand baths also help them blend into their surroundings. The family group will stay together for about six months until they merge into larger groups for the winter in mid-October. For the partridges, family life is both refuge, a haven of peace, and a place to learn and display social etiquette and good manners. Thank you.